Massey here. I figured tonight I was going to try to teach you guys how to marinate, cure, and smoke some seafood. Yeah, I love that stuff. I'm talking about dishes like pickled herring casserole, a filet of sole escabiche, and then we're going to, like, really get it smoking with a smoked scallop sandwich. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Hilda, it's going to be a big one tonight. <laughs> so all I can say to you all is welcome to Emerald Seafood Shack, and it's right here on Emerald Live. <laughs> anything as far as a smoking show without giving it up for Doc Gibbs and Cliff, everybody. Hey, Hi. Now. How are you? Smelling pretty fishy over here, huh? You know, actually, when you really think about society today, whether it's at home, in the grocery stores, in restaurants, it's amazing, really, what we take for granted as far as this whole category of either cured or smoked or marinated, and the ways that we do that. Probably one of the famous ones being the Scandinavian, and this is a cured, this is Gravlox. And uh, smoked salmon, obviously, is another one. A little uh, later on the show, we're going to do that. There's um, different types of marinating, either with salt and sugar or a combination of both, not only to preserve it, but also for wonderful dishes. One of my favorites being, being herring. And then we take things for granted, like marinating like octopus or squid into salads and how that affects, or simply a shrimp salad, uh, whether we poach them or where we, whether we marinate them or whether we make a ceviche, which is another type of marinade. Smoked scallops, one of my favorite. But how do you smoke? Do you hot smoke them, cold smoke them? Just like these smoked fish that we have. We have smoked whiting and smoked trout. And, uh, and there's those wood pieces right there that... Really, uh, there are so many varieties from mesquite to hickory. Which ones do you do? How do you do it? Can I do it on the grill? Can I do it in a wok? So I thought tonight, that's exactly what we'll do. We're going to kick it up a few notches with the old seafood shack. Smoking, pickling, curing, just having a ball. When we come back, I'm going to show you how to make some pickled herring. Stick around. We'll be right back. Watch this. going getting one of them frozen things we were kind of rocking out with Doc Gibbs and Cliff everybody <laughs> so this first um, first road that we're going to go to I was talking about some techniques about brining and about curing and I earlier said about the obvious one being the Gravlox which uh, generally is cured for two or three days salt and sugar mixture. Uh, this particular one has some citrus peel. Generally, in the Scandinavian tradition, it's also flavored with dill and uh, sometimes a little moisture or not. Sometimes they use vodka, sometimes they just use water. And then it's wrapped and it's got to be weighted so that the combination of this sugar and salt mixture can penetrate and it sort of begins to start cooking the flesh of the skin with the weight and the pressure of that. And then it's rinsed and sliced and can be kept in the refrigerator for a week or two because it's then preserved. 
Then there's brining. And brining is um, also a salt and sugar mixture. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm sure it's just like a technical difficulty here. <laughs> like maybe we forgot to pay the bill. <laughs> I have no gas. Okay, let's try this one. Good. Good. Oh, jeez. Did you do that? I mean, I wouldn't touch your drums. <laughs> so, now that we have one burner, I'm sure we're going to be doing a lot of cooking today. <laughs> Let's bring out the smoker, Hilda! <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to start with some, some water, some H2O. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use, and I always taste now since I've been set up, sugar. couple of bay leaves from the laurel tree. Actually, for this herring, we're, gonna, we're making pickled herring. And uh, I'm going to use allspice, which is a mixture of just that, allspice. And vinegar. So the vinegar is really going to be our acidity inside of this. And we're going to steep those flavors out of that. Generally, most herrings that you will find a clear. They don't have as much color as what I have here because of the allspice, but I'll tell you, we're going to have some flavor. The other way that you'll find it is after it's pickled, you may find herring that has cream or um, milk added to it. So we're going to steep that up. Now let me show you. Little, little whiting, little herrings, sardines, there's a lot of things that you can do with this. What has to happen is you have to fillet them. And I told you about the flesh side. So what we're actually doing is we're making a layer of these because the next thing now that we have to do is we have to salt them so that they begin to start curing. Now, what we're going to do, try to remove as many of those small little bones as you can. Then what you do is you use kosher salt. Mostly kosher salt is used for... <laughs> I'm having a rough start here. <laughs> when in doubt, bring out the knife. All right. <laughs> On to the road of recovery. Now, kosher salt is generally used for most curing. So what you're going to do is you're going to really, really salt these fillets of this herring really good. Probably for that side of salmon that was cured for the gravlox with sugar, probably almost a half of this box was used. But what happens is that you rinse them. Generally, what I like to do is put a piece of plastic and then you need to weight this as we talked about it. And so I just have a smaller one, or there are different weights that we can begin to start having that press. You put it inside of the ice box so that that salt begins to start curing that. I generally, now this is not as big a fish as that. That salmon probably took about 24 to 26 hours to cure. These fish will take no more than four hours. Take them out of the ice box. And then, of course, you have to rinse it. You don't want to eat all of that salt. And this is what they look like right here. When you take them after they've cured for about four hours, this is what they'll look like. And I'll show you that the skin has changed. And what you do is you, you got to rinse this about three or four times underwater, get rid of all of the salt. But this is somewhat cooked now. 
because it's preserved. And they've been doing this for hundreds and hundreds of years. So we rinse that really good three, four times. And then basically once they're rinsed three or four times, this is what we have right here. These are salt cured herring that's been rinsed so you don't get a mouth full of salt. Now from there, what you do, I like to use sterilized jar, preferably, that way it's food safe. And then what I like to do is I like to add lots of onions. These are just sliced raw onions. You could put a few garlic cloves in here if you want. You could put some black peppercorns if you'd like. And then you take the herring fillets that have been rinsed. And now basically what we'll do is I like to add more onions and then you could layer it with more fillets depending on how much you want to make. You don't see this often anymore. You can buy it in the store all the time, but there's nobody really doing a lot of this stuff anymore. You see, we don't, we don't need to boil this like forever. We're just bringing it up, steeping it up. And then what we're going to do is this. We're going to take this liquid and put it back inside of this pitcher. You smell that? It smells terrific, huh? Bay leaves don't bother me either. Then... You let this cool just a little bit. You pour that brine. That's what this is. This is a brine. You pour that brine so we can fill this jar up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Making herring. Then, once we have it covered, oh, yeah, babe. Then you properly lit it and do the whole thing where you can sterilize it. And then you can keep it. You can keep it at room temperature. As soon as you do open it to use the herring, or maybe you want to cream it, that's when you should refrigerate it. When we come back, I'm going to show you how we're going to take our pickled herring and kick it up a notch with a pickled herring casserole. Stick around! <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. We're pickling, brining, curing, smoking, doing all kinds of things. But I can tell you one thing. We are live in New York City, baby. <laughs> so now the herring has to be in that brine for at least two to three days before you can eat it so that it's properly cured or brined but it will last, as I said, and then when you open it, you want to be sure that then that's when you want to refrigerate it. And I'm opening this one here to show you what we've done. See how the onions have gotten cooked? Then I took some out, and then I drained some of that brine out because what I want to do, you can cream it right now. You could eat it like this. You could add more vegetables, raw vegetables, you could add greens, you could use it in a salad. It's just endless what you can do with it. And that's why I want to do this next dish, because I think that it's using herring that it hasn't really been done too often, making a casserole with herring. I've taken a baking dish, and I've kind of buttered, buttered it with, I, it's a good tablespoon of butter. Oops. <laughs> really, really good. And then what you want to do is you want to take some potatoes that I peeled and drain them. Now, if you're working with these potatoes, you want to work with them quick because they're going to oxidize from the air. And that's when they turn brown and nasty and all that stuff. But if you're not working with them fast, then you can just put them in water. Just remember to drain them really good and then paper, paper towel dry them when you're going to work with them. We're going to do a little layer. 
of these potatoes on the bottom of this buttered dish. And then you got to season them because they don't come seasoned out of the ground. <laughs> so we we'll season them with salt and pepper so they taste good. Then I like to take a little bit of onions. But I'm an onion freak, what can I say? <laughs> then I take some of that herring that's been drained and add some of that herring like this. Then another layer of potato. And then what I like to do I want to get this somewhat thick, but as you know, I didn't make like a cream sauce or bechamel sauce. I didn't use a roux, didn't use cornstarch, but this is a kind of a cool little thing that works. And that is, is that you take a little bit of flour, you season the potatoes again. Now you want to go light with the salt because we have, this has been brined. Nice amount of pepper. And you keep layering this. What you do, before you do your last layer, is you take some flour, a couple of tablespoons, and you just kind of do this with the flour. So I got butter on the outside of the pan and, and flour, which are the components of a roux. And I take some onions, a little more of the herring, you got more potatoes, you can do more potatoes. I think you get in the program here. Then, to finish it after it's seasoned, what you do is you take a couple of cups of milk and pour that and sort of drizzle that milk over the flour. So now I have the third component of what a bechamel or cream sauce would be. And then, I'm going to make a little topping. I've got fine breadcrumbs, and I like to put a little parsley in there to keep in check with Hilda. <laughs> I don't need no problems with Hilda. <laughs> Parmesan cheese. Yeah, I love that too. And then you can season this however you want it. You want just salt, you want just pepper, you want to kick it up a couple of notches with some, with some Creole spice, you can do that. Mix it in this bowl. Meanwhile, while I'm doing this, I'm preheating the oven about 375 degrees, no more than 400 degrees. And this is going to bake for about 30, 35 minutes. And you'll know when it's done because it starts bubbling, getting all gooey and ooey and stuff like that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Sprinkle that crumb topping on top. As much as you like. 30, 35 minutes. And in 30, 35 minutes, this is what you have. Look at that. See how it gets all like bubbly and gooey and all that chewy and... Now, you should really let this kind of set a little bit. Five to ten minutes. Let it just kind of... Because you want it to come together. Remember... We made a sauce in here that you're going to see that's got all the flavor of the potatoes and the herring and the onions, but we've got sort of that creamy sauce going on. Matter of fact, when we come back, I'm going to show you that, and then we're going to kick it up another notch with a smoked scallop sandwich. Stick around. <laughs> Rock in the house. 
Welcome back. I'm Emeril Lagasse, and if you're just tuning in, shame on you, because you just landed at the old seafood shack of Emeralds right here. And, um, you know, I had a couple of questions earlier uh, for some folks about inexpensive reading, which is a beautiful thing, and a lot of those uh, books that have a lot of heart and soul, but we take for granted. And uh, this one, being that we're doing seafood shack, we uh, sort of pulled in the kitchen of the Food Network here, and our great team back there and myself. And um, this book right here, is, it's called The Taste of Gloucester, and it's A Fisherman's Wife Cooks, written by the wives of the Gloucester and Cape Ann League of Women Voters. Um, really great book. There's a lot of simple but phenomenal recipes in here about things like herring and Friday bakes and casseroles and things. Uh, anyhow, check it out if you're interested. Smoking. Oh, I'm excited. Let me uh, show you when this cools down before we move on just how delicious. See the sauce that it kind of, what it did? It almost like kind of made like a little custard. Of course, I just made a mess too, but. <laughs> just phenomenal. But we can clean up the mess. Now, serve that little uh, beautiful thing for brunch or for late breakfast. Kind of use a little bit of essence on here to kick it up a little notch. And that's how simple it is, this potato and herring casserole. Hope you enjoy it. Now, this next dish that I'm going to do is a smoked scallop and potato sandwich. But basically, before we can do that, Enjoy. I have to kind of talk to you about three types of smoking, basically. Um, first being hot smoking. Very popular today, all over the place that you, can, that you can get. Hot smoking, very simple. You have to hot smoke over 140 degrees. You always want to make sure that the internal temperature of what you're smoking gets to 180 degrees so that you can eliminate any of those bacterias and all that food junk that they're worried about up there in Washington. Um, <clears throat> then there's cold smoking. The thing with cold smoking is that it never reaches over 90 degrees in cooking time. But internal temperature is also very, very important. So it's smoked for a longer, longer, longer period of time and Generally, when you cold smoke, there's usually some sort of curing or marinating or brining going on prior to when they put something in a cold smoker, okay? Classic example, smoked salmon. Classic example would be a lot of these type smoked fishes, the trouts and the whitings and things like that that are smoked. Generally, they'll submerge those in a brine before they will go into a cold smoker for a long period of time. Then, what about us at home? I mean, you can't use the barbecue grill. We wish we could. 12 months, 365 days out of the year. What do I do at home? Well, you can stovetop smoke. And you can either buy an inexpensive stovetop smoker like this, or you can even use a wok with a wire rack. Works also thing is, is that you got to blast the heat on a stovetop smoker for at least 10 minutes before you start smoking things. I'm going to show you. This is a little drip pan. Some people like to put their wood chips on this and on the bottom, and I'm one of those. I'm actually using hickory. I use mostly hickory when I smoke. And you're probably asking yourself, why? Why is he... Why is he using those chips that are, uh, that are wet like that? Well, you don't want them to catch on fire. You want them to smoke. You want them to smolder. So basically, like we had a bunch of these chips in here, you don't want to use any, any woods that are going to get resin, you know, like pine. You don't want to use any of that stuff. 
You want to use fruit woods, preferably, okay? Hickory is one of my favorites to use. They come packaged in a bag like this or smaller. You take out what you need, you soak them. They don't take a long time to soak. You could use your barbecue pit as well doing the same thing by putting that on side of the coals and keeping it closed and feeding it. You could do that as well. I'm going to smoke some scallops. What I'm going to do right first is add my rack in here. And um, then this sort of thing slides like right like this. <laughs> slides on there like that. You're in business. That wasn't difficult. Now, I'm going to turn. <laughs> Playing with my emotions. I'm going to turn on this pan. It's going to start getting really, really hot, okay? Then it's going to start getting smoky, and it's going to make this wonderful smoke in there. Now, I'm using smaller scallops. They're not that small, but they're not huge diver or big sea scallops. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to use my Creole spice. It has salt in it to season the scallops. You could just use salt and pepper. You could add a little sugar if you want. So I'm going to let them just sort of marinate a little bit while I'm waiting for the smoker. Then I told you what we were going to do is we were going to make a sandwich. So while I'm waiting for my scallops and that smoke to go, you can see how it's already just starting a little bit right now. I can also see that this isn't on right. There we go. So, what I'm now doing is in a non-stick pan, I'm getting this pan hot, and I peeled the potato. And what I did with the potato is I just sort of, with a hand grater, just grated the potato. This towel that I have this wrapped in is kind of wet because I'm draining a lot of the starch and water out of the potato. Then, depending on how much salt that you like, you want to just kind of salt a little bit the potato so it's seasoned. And also a lot of fresh pepper. I like a lot of fresh pepper. Look at that baby starting to smoke over there. You see that? It's starting to smell good in here. Smell like a smoke shack. <laughs> I take a little bit of olive oil like this, good olive oil, only for the potato. Mix this in. And then I've got some pomace oil or vegetable oil that I'm going to add a little bit of this. Just kind of want to cover it like that. Make sure it's hot. All right, look. Now what we can do is slide this back. And we can add our scallops in here now to start smoking our scallops. We could do fish. We could do fillets of fish like this. We could do shrimp. You could do oysters, mussels. Now, put this back on. We're going to let that smoke, really get nice flavor, just like we had the smoked scallops that were over there. And then what we're going to do here to start getting ready for when our scallops are smoked is we're going to make these little, little piles like this of potato. I know, I could eat potato just like that. I mean, I don't need anything on there. So while I'm making these potato cakes, smoking the scallops, this would be a good time for you. Well, do whatever you want to do because coming up, besides showing you how to finish this, we're going to kick it up a notch and do a filet of sole escabiche. Stick around. We'll be right back.
Hey, hey, welcome back, everybody. Just kind of doing our little potato cakes like this with salt and pepper, a little olive oil, because we're going to make a little sandwich, what I'm going to show you. I got a little sour cream, and that sour cream is kind of, uh, yeah, it's thick, but it's, it, it, needs, it needs something. It needs some love. It, it isn't like food of love yet. It's just the basic love. It's not kicked up love. So that's when I come along and decide to fork a lemon. See, I don't want all that lemon in there. I just want a little bit. I got some fresh chives. So I got a little lemony flavor in there. Then I got a little uh, white wine. The white wine's a good thing. See, it's a cooking strategy. You know, I just get them all drunk. Everything tastes good. I'll flip this over right now. You want to make sure that once this starts happening, these potato cakes, you want to be sure that you don't like overdo them and you want to be sure to just keep lowering the heat every little bit because you want the inside of the cakes to be cooked as well. When that happens, we're going to take those out. Now I've told you a gazillion times, it doesn't matter if you're deep frying, you're pan frying, when it comes out of the oil like that, that's when you want to re-season it or that's when you want to season it. Because that's when it's like, it's ready. It's, it's like, it's telling me, Emerald, I'm ready. It's like, <laughs> it wants all that flavor in there. So I'm going to give it to him. <laughs> now, then to kick this up another notch, there's a lettuce right here. It's called lamb's lettuce. Don't be frightened. <laughs> or another name for it is called mosh. You might might see it. It's really delicate. You don't want to be in there fondling it too long. <laughs> very, very delicate lettuce. And it comes these days even hydroponical. Look at this. They grow these little things in these, you know, in this little thing, and there's the mosh. It's like, you know, this is your brain on mosh. It's like, it's okay. So So I'm going to mix that chive cream, okay? Bam! 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 Bam. Those were baby bams. <laughs> and then what we're going to do is we're going to just take a little bit of good olive oil in our mosh like this. Not a lot. You know, it's, it's delicate stuff. A little pepper like this. we go. I'm glad everybody's awake. Just lightly toss it. Don't be going in there like, don't, what did the lettuce do to you? Gingerly. Just see, it's happy. All right. We got the cream. We got the mosh. We got the cakes. Let's check and see if we got some scallops. Oh, yeah, babe. We're going to turn the heat off. I need my fireman hat. <laughs> Let me take a couple of them out. Watch this. Look at this. See that? How delicious they look like that? Now, you're supposed to let them cool. Yeah, you're supposed to let them cool. Here's the deal. This is what I would do. I take one of those potato cakes. Then what I would do is I'd hit it with a little, ma uh, a little chive cream like that. Then I would take a little bit of mosh so that it like has like a little bed so that you can sleep in. <laughs> then you take a little bit of these scallops like this. Okay? Then I'd like to take another one of these cakes. Put another one like that on top. Then I'd like to take some more of this chive cream like this. Then a little bit more mosh so that it has another little bed to sleep in like that. And then, a couple of more of these little scallops like this. Okay? Am I playing with your emotions yet? Yeah. 
Oh, why not give it another layer, right? You could basically stock this to the seventh floor if you want. All you need is the product and a ladder, and you can just let it go to the moon. A little more mosh. Not supposed to be doing this. It's hot. Come on. I see you. Ha. See that? A little more tribe cream just like this to a little nappe over it. There you have it. Hot. Very hot. Unbelievable, huh? All right. Ceviches, very popular in South America. Very, very popular from South American influences where they marinate, generally in citrus. Then there's escabiche. Escabiche. Not that Escobon guy, that escabiche. <laughs> A classic one they do with sole. Little fillets of beautiful sole that you can get. Dice it up like I've done here. Check this out. Olive oil. Good olive oil. Lime juice. That's the acid that's going to make the marinade. Cilantro, jalapenos. Oh. Garlic. Yeah. Then some salt and some pepper. Lots of it. Mix that up like this. Then that goes over the raw fish. That would be now a ceviche. It would start to cook. 10 or 15 minutes, it would be done. For escabiche, you want to keep it in the refrigerator. For escabiche, look, there's the ceviche. See? It's cooked. Now what they do is they'll drain this. This is unbelievable. I'm so excited right now, I could faint. <laughs> They drain this. Then they dust it in flour. They dust it in flour like this. Really, really good. They coat it like that. And then, to finish it off, what they do, they fry it. When we come back, I'm going to show you how to finish it. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Those of you, we just did a delicious sole escabiche, which I have some more in the fryer right there. You see how golden they get? Now check this out. You gotta make a quick tartar sauce with an egg and the juice of a lime. And that's exactly what that tastes like, that escabiche. Then what I have here is I've got mustard, onion, parsley, and garlic. I love these kind of recipes like this. Right? Now, Put the lid on. And what we're going to do is make this little sauce, this little emulsion like this. Beautiful. See that? Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this sort of emulsion, limey sauce like this, in the center. And then we're gonna take the escabiche of sole, just kind of around like this. <laughs> A little bit of cilantro. And that's it, escabiche of sole. Hey, what can I say? 
I want to thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm Emeril Lagasse. See you tomorrow, everybody!